everyone, get ready for a captivating journey that will leave you craving for more. From exploring the depths of our world to understanding the human psyche, come join us on this adventure. I'm Tyler. And I'm Elizabeth. And this is the Edible Attitude Podcast. Well, good evening, dear. Good evening. How are you? I've been better. How are you? I'm good. It's good. I'm not sick like you've been. I'm, you know, fortunately. Hopefully you won't get sick. Well, I can try not to, but no promises. Okay. So how's your week been? It is only Tuesday. It is only Tuesday. You're right. But it's actually not been too bad. How about yours? Mine's been good. My weekend was good at work. I didn't do anything... You know, out of the ordinary, so, you know, that's good. Yeah. Nothing bad happened. That's I didn't, good. I didn't break anything, so that's well, a plus. That, that is a major plus. Kids did a good job on their concert tonight. They sure did. They sure did. Yeah. It Tis was, the season. Yeah. It was a good concert. I enjoyed it. It was. So last week, I enjoyed all the stuff that you brought to the episode. Did you? So this week, I thought we'd do the same thing, but different. You did Origins of Things. I'm going to do Origins of Words. Ooh, okay. I'm excited. Let's do it. The English language is a curious melting pot of words from across the globe, forged through a millennia of invasions, wars, colonial expansion, and scientific and cultural developments. Out of 7,139 different languages and 15 million unique words, oh wow, we're going to only talk about 10 of them. Okay, then. Better buckle up, Buttercup, because some of these are wild. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. I was I was very excited when I started reading some of these. Yeah. It, <laughs> some of these, I was just like, what the fuck? Like, how? How, mm-hmm. did, how did that even become a thing? Yeah, I believe so, it. So the first one is something that we all know, that we all use, or that we have eaten at some point. Oh. It is going to be the origin of the word sandwich. Oh, I I know what this is, but I'm excited. The modern concept of a sandwich using slices of bread as found within the West can arguably be traced to the 18th century Europe. However, the use of some kind of bread or bread-like substance to lie under or over some other food or used to scoop up and enclose or wrap some other type of food long predates the 18th century and is found in numerous, much older cultures worldwide. An ancient Jewish sage is said to have wrapped meat from the paschal lamb and bitter herbs in a flat, unleavened bread during Passover in the manner of a modern wrap made with flatbread. Flatbreads of only slightly varying kinds have long been used to scoop or wrap small amounts of food and root from platter to mouth throughout Western Asia and Northern Africa. Mm. From Morocco to Ethiopia to India, bread is usually baked in flat rounds, contrasting with the European loaf tradition. Huh. During the Middle Ages in Europe, thick slabs of coarse and usually stale bread called trenchers were used as plates. After a meal, the food-soaked trencher was fed to a dog or to beggars at the tables of the wealthy and eaten by diners in more modest circumstances. Huh. I would, sl- I would eat the shit out of that. I feel like we saw something like that in Game of Thrones. Probably. I know we saw plates, but I feel like at some point they were carrying, like, thick things of bread. I feel like or we got to rewatch it to really pay attention. Or maybe Outlander? Maybe that. Yeah, that's that's totally plausible. I guess we just have to rewatch those shows. Oh, shucks. I know. The immediate culinary precursor with a direct connection to the English sandwich was to be found in the Netherlands of the 17th century, where a naturalist observed that in the taverns, beef hung from the rafters, quote, which they cut into thin slices and eat with bread and butter, laying the slices upon the butter. Hmm. Yeah, it's a sandwich. Initially perceived as food that men shared while gaming and drinking at night, the sandwich slowly began appearing in polite society as a late-night meal among the aristocracy. Oh, backing up. Yeah. Gaming does not mean video games, by oh, the way. Oh, shit, I had no idea. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure everybody knew. <laughs> the sandwich is named after John Montague, 4th Earl of Sandwich, 
who was an 18th century English aristocrat. It is commonly said that Lord Sandwich, during long sessions of cribbage and other card games at public gaming houses, would order his valet to bring him salt beef between two pieces of toasted bread. Lord Sandwich. Lord Sandwich. What a name. Yeah. It, it would be weird now, but at the time it was yeah. probably normal. Right. I think it was just the name of a town or a village or whatever. Yeah. He was fond of this form of food because it allowed him to continue gambling while eating without the need for a fork and without getting his cards greasy from eating meat with his bare hands. Mm. The dish then grew in popularity in London and Sandwich's name became associated with it. That's kind of cool. I like the etymology. The, you know, learning what words mean. Yeah, etymology is crazy. Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, something, a word in our language could mean something very different in another one. Oh, for sure. An alternative is provided by Sandwich's biographer, who suggests Sandwich's commitments to the Navy and to politics and the arts mean the first sandwich was more likely to have been consumed at his desk rather than at a gaming table. Oh, that makes sense, too. I can see that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, I guess. Yeah, not really. Mm. He did it. He did it, yep. He was the guy. Yep. The sandwich's popularity in Spain and England increased dramatically during the 19th century when the rise of industrial society and the working classes made fast, portable, and inexpensive meals essential. In London, for example, at least 70 street vendors were selling ham sandwiches by 1850. So it only took about 50 years for it to be popular. Ham sandwiches. Just ham. Oh. I'm. There might have been butter. I have <laughs> no clue. Well, there's probably some sort of... It was a street vendor, so it was probably lard, right? Oh, crap. <laughs> Lord, I hope not. <laughs> Lord, I hope not. During that decade, sandwich bars also became an important form of eating establishment in western Holland, typically serving liver and salt beef sandwiches. Mmm, yummy. I feel like liver's got enough salt on it already. Good lord. Does it? I don't know, but like... What? (laughs) Have you eaten liver? Heck no. That's disgusting. I I feel like it would be, I guess, intestines, right? It's liver. It's not an intestine. It's an organ. Some organs, I'm sure. Have you eaten organs? Yeah. What have you eaten? Deer heart. Oh. It's very good. I'm sure... My father used to eat the turkey heart and liver when we were, like, cooking that. It was disgusting. My grandpa eats turkey gizzards. Yep, that too. That's, yeah. Well, no. well, then you shouldn't eat the gravy that my mom makes because she chops up the stuff and puts it in the gravy. Well, it's cooked. I got to hope so. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Don't you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the U.S., the sandwich was first promoted as an elaborate meal at supper. Oh, I thought. I only wish. You want sandwiches for supper? You got it. I'm going to stack them bitches real high. Just (laughs) put like 13 different cheeses and meats on there. That would be awesome, by the way. I know. For you. (laughs) By the early 20th century, as bread became a staple of the American diet, the sandwich became the same kind of popular, quick meal as was already widespread in the Mediterranean. Moving on to our next one. I'm excited. This is my favorite one on the whole list. Why would you make it number two if it's your favorite? I didn't know it was my favorite until I was done. Oh, okay. And I looked back. I was reading it back, you Mm -hmm. know, and I was like, this one, this one's got me. All right, carry on. We're looking at the word clue. Okay. For this word, we're going to travel way back in time. Way back? Back to ancient Greece. Okay. According to Greek legend, Minos, the mythical ruler of the island of Crete, Mm -hmm. managed to offend the Olympian deity Poseidon, the god of the sea. Mm -hmm. To cut a long story short, Poseidon had given him a white bull, and Minos was meant to sacrifice as a tribute to the deity. But Minos, who appears not to have been a great reader of Greek legends, (laughs) managed to piss Poseidon off by sacrificing one of his own bulls in the place of the one sent by the deity. Oh. If there's one thing that the Greek gods excelled at, it's taking offense to dumb shit. That's true. And it was handing out retribution on those who had crossed them. (laughs) Poseidon's revenge on poor old Minos was to cause his wife to fall in love with the bull, the white bull. Oh. And having mated with it, she gave birth to a creature that was endowed with the head of a bull attached to the body of a man. This creature was given the name Minotaur. 
That is hor- horrific, but okay. Well, you know, when you're a god, you can do horrific things and get away with it. How did she survive that childbirth? It had a body of a man. Yeah, but the head comes out first, my dude. Maybe it was a little bull head. I suppose they're not born with horns, so... Right. Probably grew in later. I would hope so. Okay, carry on. As the Minotaur grew, it proved to be a ferocious creature who developed an appetite for human flesh. Oh, God. So Minos hid it away in a vast labyrinth, the design of which was so intricate as to cause any person who found their way into it become hopelessly lost and impossible to find the way out. Oh, shit. Obviously, the Minotaur needed to eat at some point, and its diet consisted of criminals who were pushed into the mage. Sorry. Were... <laughs> that, took me, that took me off. Okay, sorry. Continue. Obviously, the Minotaur <laughs> needed to eat at some point. And just casually, it consisted of criminals. Oh, okay. Yep. Right. okay. Its diet yes. consisted of criminals who were pushed into the maze for it to feast on. Okay. <laughs> All right. However, every ninth year, the Minotaur required a dietary supplement in the form of a tribute of seven youths and seven maidens that had been exacted on the people of Attica, the city in which Minos resided. Right. Okay. Um, how did they know that this needed to be done? Ancient Greece. That's bullshit! Oh, okay. Just, I was just wondering. The thought process was, just, you know, like, I every know. nine months, I think we need to get... Nine, nine, sorry, nine years... We need to sacrifice some virgins. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Gotta, no, gotta whatever. appease the demigod that was born. That's so stupid. Anyway, continue. So the revenge had been exacted on the people of Attica on account of the fact that Minos' son had been murdered in that region. So Minos did it. Oh, okay. All so right. he was pissed off at the people and he was like, look, we're, we're going to, I'm going to get my revenge this time. Wow. That's, that's really horrible revenge. Yeah. Alrighty. Okay. Two of these nine yearly tributes had been levied on the people of Attica, and the third was fastly approaching. When it came to being eaten by the Minotaur, all were equal. It so happened that one of those due to be eaten as part of Tribute 3 was Theseus, the son of the Athenian king, and he was duly packed off to the cells to await his fate with the others. Theseus, however, decided that he wasn't going to take this laying down, and he became determined that, by fair means or foul, he was going to slay the Minotaur and thus free his people from the need for future offerings. Of course, as Greek legends go, Minos' daughter falls in love with Theseus, mm-hmm. and she had given him a ball of yarn, which he tied to the portal on entering the labyrinth, and which he then unraveled as he picked his way through the twists and turns in search of his foe. Oh, spoiler alert, he kills it. Oh, no. Once the deed was done... And the Minotaur had been slain. Theseus and his band of ex-delectable appetizers <laughs> were able to follow the unraveled yarn back through the labyrinth and find their way out again. So how is this related? He left a clue with the yarn. So I don't know. Some sort of Greek word, I'm sure. Bingo. Well, in order to find out how it's related, you have to move forward in time to 1343. Oh, wow. To the Middle Ages, to be precise, and the time of one Geoffrey Chaucer. In Chaucer's time, a ball of yarn was known as a clue, spelled C-L-E-W. Okay. He wrote a poem about it, but I'm not going to read it because there are words in there that I cannot pronounce and I'm not about to try. Okay, so fair enough. There was a word in there, probably 10 characters long Mm -hmm. and a bunch of Fs. And I don't know how to pronounce that. Alrighty. By the 17th century, the universal reverence that later writers held towards Chaucer led to the figurative use of clue of thread, still spelled C-L-E-W, as an expression for any guidance that would lead to a solution for a puzzle, problem, or difficulty. It came to mean quite literally that which points the way. As language evolved, the words began to change their spellings, but not their meanings, such as blue. Blue is also spelled B-L-E-W. Oh, yeah. But for some reason we changed it. I I feel like a lot of times it's language... We take things, spellings from different languages and it just made it sound right, like probably French or some something like that. Probably. By the late 19th century, thanks to the emergence and popularity of crime fiction, Clue, C-L-U-E, had been fixed in the popular imagination as something that might lead to the solution of a mystery. Indeed, several other words that came to be associated with detective work hark back to the original meaning of Clue, or Clue, as a ball of yarn. Hmm. 
Thus, clues would be unraveled, threads would be followed, an investigation might have various strands, and a criminal who told a tall tale might be spinning a yarn. Oh, I like it. And now you know. And now I know. Yeah, that was my favorite one to research. A lot of information about that. That is one. I like that. Makes sense. I mean, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's understandable. Absolutely. Whether or not that whole thing is real, I doubt. But you never know. I know. Greek mythology is amazing. I love it. Greek mythology is wild. It is. It's probably my favorite subject ever. For sure. Even more than the Roman Empire. Even more than the Roman Empire. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> the next word comes from London. Okay. It's hooligan. You're a hooligan. You're a hooligan. <laughs> the word first appeared in print in London police court reports in 1894, referring to the name of a gang of youths in the Lambeth area of London, the Hooligan Boys, and later the O'Hooligan Boys. Oh. So they just put an O and an apostrophe in there and call her that. It's probably some sort of an Irish slur because they didn't like the Irish. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> no one liked the Irish at some point. In August 1898, the murder of Henry Mappin in Lambeth committed by a member of the gang drew further attention to the word, which was immediately popularized by the press. The London newspaper wrote in an article in August of 1898, quote, The avalanche of brutality which under the name of hooliganism has cast such a dire slur on the social records of South London. The inquest was carried out by a man who remarked that the activity of the gang he referred to was not confined to Lambeth, but extended to numerous other districts. It was composed of young fellows who scorned to do a stroke of work and obtained a living by blackmailing. It was a common practice for three or four of these men to walk into a shop and offer the shopman the alternative of giving them a dollar for drink or having the, his shop wrecked. Hmm. Oh, a goddamn hooligan. God damn it. Get off my lawn, hooligan. <laughs> Along with hooligan, we have many words for troublemakers in English. Mm -hmm. Ruffian, thug, hoodlum, etc. Mm -hmm. But if you're called a hooligan, the origin is less clear. According to the Oxford English Entomology Dictionary, the name originates from the surname of an Irish family, huh. Hoolahan. Oh. Mentioned in an old song from the 1890s. Another theory is that back during the 1745 Jacobite Rising, an English commander misheard the Scots Gaelic word for the insect midge and created the word hooligan to express his frustration at all the pesky midges. That's hilarious. I found the Gaelic word. Yeah. Again, not going to try to say that because mm -hmm. I would just murder that whole thing. The next word is nice. Okay. Just nice. Just so nice. So what is nice to you? Nice just means pleasant. Pleasant. Yeah. Easy going. Yeah. Easy to talk to, that type of thing. Right. Well, as it turns out, nice is actually a negative term derived from a Latin word meaning unaware or ignorant. Oh. Couldn't have even thought that was a thing. No. The sense of ignorant was carried over into English when the word was first borrowed via the French in the early 1300s. And for almost a century, nice was used to characterize a stupid, ignorant, or foolish person. That's so weird. <laughs> right. Hmm. <laughs> Everybody's calling people nice. Really, they're just calling them dumb originally. That's funny. Allegedly. Allegedly. Starting in the late 1300s, nice began to refer to, quote, conduct a person or clothing that was considered excessively luxurious or lavishous. Yeah. However, by the 1400s, a new, more neutral sense of nice was emerging. At this time, nice began to refer to, quote, a person who was finely dressed, someone who was scrupulous, or something that was precise or fussy. By the late 1500s, Nice was further softened, describing something as refined or cultured, especially used in polite society. How nice. I know. The high value placed on being coy, delicate, and reserved was instrumental in the semantic improvement of the term nice in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So yeah, originally, it was not the same at all. Mm. I don't know how they got nice and ignorant in the same... Well... It just matters as to when the word started and what they meant when they first made up the word. 
I suppose. That makes sense. Yeah. Things can change. Things that we said as children mean something completely different nowadays. Yeah, people don't even say YOLO anymore. I'm sad. Aren't you sad? Yeah. YOLO is so stupid. Yeah, you only live once, man. Yeah. You only live once. Yeah, that's kind of dumb. Well, you got to say it before you do something dumb. That's the thing. I guess at that point you would still be nice, so. (laughs) (laughs) You get me there. You ever had a bad dream before? Oh, yeah. I have them all the time. Yeah. I had one one the other day. What? Yeah. Uh Oh. Then my brakes went out in my car. Oh. Yeah. Was, would you classify it as a nightmare? Yeah, I would. Because that's what the word we're going to talk about. A nightmare, also known as a bad dream, is an unpleasant dream that can cause a strong emotional response from the mind, typically fear, but also despair, anxiety, disgust, or sadness. After a nightmare, a person will often awaken in a state of distress and may be unable to return to sleep for a short period of time. Nightmares can have physical causes such as sleeping in an uncomfortable position or having a fever or psychological causes such as stress or anxieties. Yep. I've had, you know, nightmarish fever dreams before, absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. But that's just because, you know, my body's being weird. Right. And I'm sick. Exactly. So I I just kind of associate that with that thing and just kind of ignore it. Fever dreams. Fever dreams are wild. Eating before going to sleep, which triggers an an increase in the body's metabolism and brain activity, can be a potential stimulus for nightmares also. In common language, the meaning of nightmare has extended as a metaphor to many bad things, such as a bad situation or a scary monster or person. (laughs) We all understand what a nightmare is, Mm -hmm. but why the root word mare? I don't know. Usually nightmare, it's night. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Mm Mm-hmm. So a mare actually refers to a female goblin that sits on you, suffocates you while you sleep, and tangles her hair around you in a mare lock and tries to induce bad thoughts. What the fuck? Right? (laughs) I thought that was very interesting. People were so fucked up back then. Like, they had nothing (laughs) nothing to pass the time other than to make up this... Horrible, horrible stories. But it's not just any goblin. It's a specific female goblin. Yeah. Well, I mean, a mare is a a female horse, correct? Yep. But the term has no connection with the modern English word for a female horse, in fact. Oh. And the word nightmare is also cognate with the German word nachtmar. Yeah. Germans are always at play and things. I know. They're always doing... Got damn Germans. They're always doing wild shit. That's bullshit! The scorchers demons of Iranian mythology, known as Deves, are likewise associated with the ability to affect their victims with nightmares. Oh. So Germans and Iranians. Okay. I don't fucking know why. <laughs> I, I guess. Sure. Okay, I can see, like, the German... You know, talking about goblins and stuff, because they got a long the history Krampus. of... Yeah, Krampus, yeah. That's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> the next word we have on our list is shambles. My life's a shambles. No, it's not. <laughs> but sure. <laughs> if you think it is. It isn't. I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> My life is not a shambles, finally. After all these After years. After all these years. <laughs> The origin of the word shambles is a real mess, literally, <laughs> which is ironic because... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> no, it really is. Like, this whole history of it is wild. Well, it makes sense, I guess. Shambles literally means a real mess. Yeah, it does. It's not uncommon to hear English speakers complaining that their life is in shambles. <laughs> like you just did. <laughs> Shambles is both an old word and a new one. Hmm. It's old in that most of its senses had developed by the end of the 16th century, and it's new in that the senses in which now commonly used date only from the 1920s. Oh, interesting. So it was used up until then, didn't get used hardly at all, Mm -hmm. and then brought back. Just like... I love that. Just like a lot of shit. History always repeats itself. It sure does. Don't I know it. What's that supposed to fucking mean? Uh, we're going to be in shambles again? No, you're going to be in shambles no, my, again? my children told me the other day they wish they were born in the 90s because we had such cool things. No, we did not. 
We had dial-up internet, and I don't want to go back to dial-up internet. I blew their minds when I told them about cell phones and charging per text message and having a certain amount of minutes to talk on your phone. That's understandable, because during that whole thing, it blew my mind. Like, why wasn't this easier? Why are we doing all this shit, you know? (laughs) Why do we have to pay for literally every word? You young whippersnappers. Yeah, yeah. Shambles originally meant a stool and a money changer's table. Later, it acquired the additional meaning of a table for the exhibition of meat for sale, which in turn gave rise to the early 15th century to a use of the plural form of the meaning meat market. So a shamble meant a meat market. It eventually turned into that, yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. All right. A further extension of meaning in the 16th century produced the sense of a slaughterhouse. That meaning quickly led to the figurative use of shambles to refer to a place of terrible slaughter or bloodshed. Okay. In the early 20th century, another extension of the meaning took place. Shambles acquired the senses, a scene or state of great destruction, a scene or state of great disorder and confusion, and great confusion, a mess. Yep, that's what it means. Which would make sense that it would still keep the whole messy thing. Yeah. Because meat markets are messy. Yeah, absolutely. Mur- slaughterhouses yeah. are messy. I was going to say murder house, but no. It's still a murder house. It's there's slaughtering cows. It's murder. No, that's food. It's murder. Well, what are you talking about? These cannibals. Is that murder or is that slaughter? That's a different topic. We're not talking about cannibals. It's the same thing. They're still eating. It's for food. Yeah. I suppose. Okay, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Good. Glad. <laughs> if you are enjoying this topic and you would like to talk more about it, you can find us at Edible Attitude or at Edible Attitude Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. So I know a lot of people have these on their body, but I do not. I know you have a couple. Okay. You want to get more? Oh, a tattoo? A tattoo. I only have one couple. How well do you know me? Yeah, a couple. I have one. That looks like a couple put together. No, it's one. It's one? It's one. I always thought it was more than that. No, that is I'm one. I apologize. One tattoo. I'm sorry. With different parts to it. I guess I should have. You asked. should apologize. I'm going to apologize. I did. Now you owe me a tattoo. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now that we have that cleared up. I'm getting you a Mike Tyson tattoo. Please don't. Right in your face. No. Bam. Please don't. You want the right side or the left side? The entire forehead. My left side's my bad side, so oh. let's do that. <laughs> okay. The word tattoo or tatau in the 18th century is a loan word from the Samoan word tatau. Okay. It means to strike. Before the importation of the Polynesian word, the practice of tattooing had been described in the West as painting, scarring, or staining. Yeah, I can see that. Its first known usage in English appeared in 1786 in Captain James Cook's journal, in which he described the tradition of tattooing among the people he met during his voyage in Polynesia. The practice of tattooing existed in England before this time, but before we acquired the loan word from Polynesia, it referred to as a form of painting. In fact, when a native Indonesian man of New Guinea was sadly brought over to the UK as a slave in 1691, he was known among English people as, quote, the painted prince due to the markings on his body. Oh, Preserved tattoos on ancient mummified human remains reveal that tattooing has been practiced throughout the world for thousands of years. In 2015, scientific reassessment of the age of the two oldest known tattoo mummies identified Otzi as the oldest example then known. This body, with 61 tattoos, was found embedded in a glacial ice in the Alps and was dated to 3250 BCE. Neat. In a glacier in the Alps. That's pretty sweet. I That's like it. That's wild. Uh-huh. In 2018, the oldest figurative tattoos in the world were discovered on two mummies from Egypt, which are dated between 3351 and 3017 BCE. That's pretty neat. What is your favorite thing to dip french fries in? Mayonnaise. Really? Yeah. It's delicious. I like mayonnaise on burgers. You dip your french fries in, it's a game changer. I feel like... Custard's way better for fries. Well, yes, but mayonnaise is a close second. Or you do mayonnaise and ketchup together. So I'm, I'm assuming you mean ketchup. Mayo chip? Mayo chip. Yes. The word ketchup is next on our list. The history of the word ketchup is really unclear, 
and has multiple competing theories. It has three, in fact. Okay. The first theory is called the Amoy Theory. A popular folk entomology is that the word came to English from the Cantonese word ke zap, literally meaning tomato sauce. Oh. Another theory among academics is that the word derives from one of two words from the Fujian region of coastal southern China, koi chipe or ke chipe. Oh. Both of these words come from either the Quanzhou dialect, a Moi dialect, or Zhang Zhao dialect, where it meant the brine of pickled fish or shellfish. Delicious. There are citations of Koi Chaip in the dictionary of the vernacular or spoken language of the Amoy from 1873, defined as brine or pickled fish or shellfish. Mm, that sounds amazing. That doesn't sound good. It sounds so delectable. Yeah. <laughs> The next theory is the Malay theory. Ketchup may have entered the English language from the Malay word kityap. 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 Okay. Originally meaning soy sauce. Oh. The word itself derives from the Chinese terms. In Indonesian cuisine, which is similar to Malay, the term kichap refers to fermented savory sauces. Two main types are well known in their cuisine. Kikap, a sin, which translates to salty kikap, and keycap manis, or sweet keycap. Keycap manis is a sweet soy sauce that is a mixture of soy sauce with brown sugar, molasses, garlic, ginger, anise, coriander, and a bay leaf reduced over medium heat until rather syrupy. A third type keycap ikan, meaning fish keycap, is fish sauce similar to the Philippine patis. It is not, however, soy based. Okay, then. Weird. Yes. It all sounds the same. It does. And the final theory we have is the European Arabic theory. An American anthropologist relies on a claim that ketchup is a cognant of the French escavache, meaning food in sauce. The word also exists in Spanish and Portuguese forms as escabiche, hmm. a sauce for pickling, which a culinary historian traced back to Arabic cabis, or pickling with vinegar. The term was anglicized to kavach, a word first attested in the late 17th century at the same time as ketchup. The word entered the English language in Britain during the late 17th century, appearing in print as catchup, C-A-T-C-H-U-P, in the 1690s, and later ketchup in 1711. That's interesting. The only the first one had anything to do with tomatoes. Right. Everything else was like soy sauce or fish. <laughs> or pickled. Yeah. Something pickled. Yeah, just like barbecue sauce is flavored ketchup. No, it's not. It is. No. <laughs> it is. It's ketchup, but Both just... Less for me. Sweeter. Yeah, it depends. Depends on what kind of barbecue sauce you're talking about. Sweet Baby Ray's. Okay. Definitely sweet ketchup. Sweet ketchup. <laughs> no, it's Sweet Baby Ray's. That's bullshit! You know what's going to take over the world one day? Black cats. No. Robots. Yeah. They're going to take our jobs. Let them. That's the next word on this list. I'd let the AI take care of my job. That's totally fine. Yeah, if they pay us, sure. Right. We just got to make sure the AI don't evolve so they understand, like, free will and all that nonsense. Mm. But I doubt it. Right. <laughs> you can't stop nature. That's not nature. Evolution. That's not evolution either. Yeah, it is. It, they evolve to understand more. It's uh, evolving. I suppose. It's didn't a form of nature. Didn't you make me watch a movie? Did well, I make I, you watch a movie? Probably not. You just watched it of your own volition, dear. No, you made me watch a movie with you. I did not make you watch anything. And there was a movie and like about AI. I feel like it. Anyway, I digress. It was Ready Player One, but that has nothing to do with AI. I'm just saying. No, there was another. It was like an 80s movie. Of AI? I could just be on drugs or something. I have no idea. You're having one of them fever dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a female goblin sitting on there your is. chest? There is. There is. Absolutely. It feels like it. Oh, my. Back to robot. Yes, yeah, sorry. Back to robots. <laughs> the word robot was introduced to the public by a Czech writer in a play called R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, published in 1920. The play begins in a factory that uses a chemical substitute for protoplasm to manufacture living, simplified people called robots. The play does not focus in detail on the technology behind the creation of these living creatures, but in their appearance, they prefigure modern ideas of androids, creatures who can be mistaken for humans. Oh. These mass-produced workers are depicted as efficient but emotionless, 
incapable of original thinking and indifferent to self-preservation. The writer, however, did not coin the word. He wrote a short letter in reference to an entomology in the Oxford English Dictionary in which he named his brother as the actual originator. Neat. So this dude just like made a play and he was like, no, 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 no. That was my bro. My bro did that. He gets credit. <laughs> that was nice of him. Yeah, what a good guy. Bros beating bros. <laughs> For real. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> in an article in the Czech Journal, he explained that he had originally wanted to call the creatures labori, or workers from Latin labor. However, he did not like the word and sought advice from his brother, who suggested robotai. The word robata literally means self-labor and figuratively hard work in Czech, and oh. also, more generally, work, labor in many Slavic languages. That is brilliant. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Use your word and make a new word. Yep. In all English. Wor all yeah. words are made up. They are. <laughs> So is entomology an actual thing, then, if all words are made up? Everything's made up, babe. Everything. I suppose. Created. Yeah, same thing. I, I always like to see, like, like nowadays there's a lot of creators, right? Yeah. On the internet making right. shit. But we've been creators since the dawn of man. Yeah, we've had to. So why is this now becoming a label, you know? Yeah, it's a good question. English pronunciation of the word has evolved relatively quick since its introduction. In the United States during the late 1930s to early 1940s, the second syllable was pronounced with a long O, like rowboat. Rowboat. By the late 1950s to early 1960s, some were pronouncing it with a short U, like robot. Hmm. While others use a softer O, like robot. By the 1970s, its current pronunciation, robot, had become predominant. I like it. Kind of like GIF and GIF. GIF is peanut butter. GIF is a movable picture. Amen. What about data and data? Data is what moves through wires okay. and through the air. Mm -hmm. You're moving data around. Mm -hmm. Data is what you can physically see. I like that too. Like you can physically see the binary code yep. on screen. Absolutely. In like a, like a graph, oh, like a bar graph, you know? Mm -hmm. This might be your favorite one. Okay. I'm just guessing. It's the last word on the list. The word is avocado. <laughs> you mean free shavakadu? Free shavakadu. Exactly. Oh, For excited. those of you who don't know that meme, you need to look up free shavakadu and you'll understand. The word avocado comes from the Spanish aguacate, which derives from the Nahuatl word avocado, which goes back to the proto aztecian pawa. In Molina's Nahuatl dictionary, avocado is given also as the translation for testicle. And this has been taken up in popular culture where a <laughs> frequent claim that is the testicle was the word's original meaning. <laughs> However, this is not the case. Oh, darn. As the original meaning can be reconstructed rather as avocado, rather the word seems to have been used in Nahuatl as an euphemism for testicle. The modern English name comes from a rendering of the Spanish aguacate as avogado, like cat. Like oh. gato, avogato. Oh. Interesting. So, cat nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, there's a guy to big for a cat nut. <laughs> That's too funny. Their earliest known written use in English is attested from 1697 as avogato pear, mm -hmm. later avocado pear, due to its shape. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Some different regional names it has. In the UK... The term avocado pear, applied when avocados first became commonly available in the 1960s, is sometimes used. Originating as a diminutive in Australian English, a clipped form, avo, has since become a common colloquialism in South Africa and the United Kingdom. It is known as butterfruit in parts of India and Hong Kong. Butterfruit? Oh, I guess it's kind of... It's buttery. It is buttery. Especially when you cut it with a knife. Yeah. And that's going to do it, dear. That's all I got. That was fantastic. I learned a lot. Which one, which one was your favorite? Or the most interesting? Clue and Shambles were probably my favorite. I know you said Clue was your favorite, but that was very interesting. And I think that was the most informative. The one that makes the most sense. That and Shambles. I can get behind Shambles. Yeah. I mean, the, I think there's a... In, I think it's Scotland? Or it's England somewhere? Where they videotape Diagon Alley for it's Harry in, Potter. In Bur 
You can say Edinburgh better than I can. In Edinburgh? Pretty sure. It's in Edinburgh? Almost positive. Oh, the street of yep, Diagon mm-hmm. Alley. Yep. Mm-hmm. They have the shambles mm-hmm. over there. Mm-hmm. It's literally just called the shambles because mm-hmm. there's all these low countertops that are protruding out into the street where okay. the oh yeah where the uh, butchers would put their meat for sale. Gotcha. Okay. Which that one is up there with one of the most interesting ones, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know agree. there's a lot more. Mm-hmm. But those are the ones that I found Mm -hmm. to be, I guess, easiest to understand. Right. There was shampoo I was going to do. Yeah. But that one was really confusing. Okay. Well, this was fun. I very much enjoyed this episode. I thank you all for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. We appreciate every one of you listening. We wouldn't be here without you. Absolutely. Every like, every share, all of it, it really helps. It does, absolutely. 100%. And like Elizabeth said, we appreciate it all. As always, I'm Elizabeth. I'm Tyler. And this is Edible Attitude Podcast.